Thank you. Do that. Yeah. Father, we thank Diane um, for the way that she hears from you uh, and is able to communicate that to us and that the gift that she has um, for hearing your word uh, but also um, bringing that as a teacher and a leader so we just ask this morning uh, that you would be uh, blessing her as she speaks and giving her everything that she needs but also that you would be giving us uh, ears to hear and what you want to tell us as Di speaks this morning. Amen. Oh, how do you follow that? I feel like I need a cheer section for this part as well. Worship, <laughs> yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> Worship was amazing. You guys are in fine form, not just these guys, you guys as well. It was so wonderful. And I'm really glad that the roof is still on. Did you hear all the creaks and groans? So um, can I have three people praying for the roof <laughs> that we get to stay in here safely? Three people. Anyone that had chocolate, pray as well, all right? <laughs> that was great. Shelley, thank you so much. And Steph, you just hold this space so well, so thank you. I'm going to tell you a story about my dad and my mum, because that's what I want to tell today, not just a dad's story. I'm going to share a story. When I was about 10 years old, my dad, he was an engineer. He was also a chaplain. And he was also a lay preacher and lots of other things. And my mum, she was a nurse, a midwife, actually. And she was a tennis player and a church organist and lots of other things. At 10 years old, they came home from church one Sunday morning and they said, quick, we've got visitors coming for lunch. It was a Sunday, so that wasn't unusual for us. Our family dinner table often was a place that was extended for many visitors. Our family of six had lots of chairs that we could put around our dinner table. And our family was used to putting up a kid's table if we needed it, which was always fun. For a 10-year-old, we would always say, do we need a kid's table? Yeah! So we would be in a different space, which all sorts of shenanigans went on. We often had missionaries that were coming from all over the world, coming to visit our church or visit my parents. And so we had all sorts of stories happening around the dinner table. For me as a 10-year-old, hearing some of their stories was better than watching a movie. It was so much fun. So we were full of anticipation. Visitors were coming. Yay! This family was preparing a meal for some visitors. We didn't know who they were going to be. So Dad welcomed them in. First came in the woman. She was carrying the tiniest baby I've ever seen as a 10-year-old. This little baby didn't look well. This little baby I learned later was severely undernourished. Dad then welcomed, welcomed in the guy that was with this family, he had this massive long beard. I'm looking to see who, nah, bet, bet all the, every beard in here, he beat it. It was so much better. And he had a really long shaggy beard. So we had this woman and the only kind way of describing her was she was kind of looking like a hippie. And so he also looked like a hippie, plus the little baby. As they walked in, the guy kind of, took all the space up and she became a little bit of a shadow. And I noticed, I remember thinking, did the air in the room just get sucked out when he walked in? Have you ever met someone like that? Where they just... <laughs> they command a presence. <laughs> Thank you. We good? So this guy was like that. As soon as he walked in, he kind of sucked the air out of the room and we're all a little bit fascinated about what was to come. So we sat at the table and I had the joy of serving them drinks because they were thirsty and we brought out all the food and put it on the table and mum was there holding the little baby who was crying and not so happy. And as we did, I could hear whispers in the kitchen between mum and dad. And as a 10-year-old, I was noticing there was a little bit of tension. And I heard them talking, and apparently the church people had said, don't bring those people home. We don't know them. They're not safe. 
We don't know anything about them. But mum and dad, they just did that because that's what we do. And then we ate a meal together. It all went well. And it was great to hear some of their story. The kids' table went well just with the kids. (laughs) And the adults sat there with the little baby crying as well. But there was something that wasn't quite right. Now, it wasn't fear. It was just messy. It wasn't scary. It was just costly. It felt costly and uncomfortable to have this family with us. It wasn't like the other missions that were there telling stories. And you know, kids can feel that tension too, right? Do you remember as a kid feeling tension in your home? It can be scary and sometimes it can be costly and sometimes uncomfortable, but it was still feeling safe. It just was uncomfortable. Anyway, these visitors had nowhere to go after that. So all of a sudden, this meal was now an overnighter. Ah. So our lounge room suddenly got set up to be their room. And they were staying overnight. We were washing all their clothes. We were making sure the baby had some fresh clothes for the morning. It was all pretty familiar. Mum and Dad did that a lot. My parents were pretty good at opening their home and pretty good at opening their hearts to strangers. My parents taught me a lot about how to host strangers. And so I'm really proud to be able to share that story today, even though there was tension. It was uncomfortable, but it was the right thing to do. I learned that as a 10-year-old. Days later, felt like a month to this 10-year-old, They were still in our lounge room. Days later, we were still serving them food. In fact, I have a a really significant memory of Mr. Hippie Guy standing in front of our pantry at the place where us kids weren't allowed to open, and they had eaten all of our favourite things out of the pantry, and he said, there's none left. We need more snacks. And he became really demanding that our pantry was bare. Then it got a little bit uneasy. Then it got a little bit scary. Perhaps you've been in places like that where the cupboard's bare because of your generosity. Kids can feel that tension. Kids are also learning by what we do. My mum and dad were brilliant. They continued to care for this family. They continued to offer solutions to get help for the baby. They continued to offer the guy solutions to provide for his family. And we learnt later, through the church people, (laughs) that this family had moved through the region to different places, burnt bridges, not behaved very well, only Mr Hippie, not Mrs Hippie. And so I tell you that story as I reflect on it and as we wrap up our our series on remembering the poor. Today we're going to look at a a, a passage that's kind of a little bit heavy for Father's Day and all the frivolity that we've had. But I feel like the Lord's just wanting to encourage you as a church, encourage you as individuals, that there is an inheritance waiting for every person that welcomes lives. Are you ready for it? We're going to turn, and if you've got your Bibles, whatever, that you're old, this is the words that Jesus will say to us today. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. Today we're going to see that Jesus loved and had a bias for the poor, those that were underprivileged, those that were needy, because when we are with them, we see him. And Jesus identifies himself with the poor, and apparently he takes it really personally about how we treat those that are the least. So today when I talk about the least from this passage, we're talking about the disadvantaged, those who have been oppressed, those that are hurting, those that have no resources or lack resources, or those that are feeling like strangers. And it turns out that Jesus was irresistible to all those that are the least. 
He was irresistible to all those that were down on their luck. He had fishermen that followed him. He had not the upper crust of society that were his followers. They, in fact, called his followers uneducated and ordinary people, right? We're in good company. (laughs) They were broken, they were hurting, they were hungry, and Jesus noticed and hung out with all the outliers of society because he was one of them. He came as a tiny baby. He came to parents that were under-resourced. And in fact, instead of bringing lambs for their temple offering, they had to bring two turtle doves, which were definitely an indication that they were family under-resourced. So let's have a look at this, starting at verse 31. When the Son of Man had come in, uh, comes in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne as nations will be gathered in his presence. And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Happy Father's Day. Intense, right? Let's just have a look at that first line, the Son of Man comes in his glory. We've been singing about that already today. We've been singing about the King that sits on his throne. The Son of Man is Jesus. When Jesus is on his throne, he's going to have all his angels with him. And then if we read Revelation, that is millions upon millions of angels with him. Can you picture this scene? Can you picture that when Jesus returns, the Son of Man is going to be sitting on his throne. He's going to be with, coming with all his glory, not as a tiny baby. And what's he going to do? He's going to gather all the peoples, all the nations. And then like a shepherd, Jesus tells us he's going to start to say, left, right, left, left, right. Let's read on. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from creation of the world. Again, can you hear the invitation from the king of glory when he returns? He's going to say to some of those gathered in front of him, Come, you are blessed from the father. You are blessed by him and you have an inheritance that's been prepared for you. Anyone want to be on that side? Anyone ready for that inheritance that we get as being blessed by the Father? Can you imagine? I wonder, is there anyone here today that thought of Jesus sitting on the throne during the week and had this picture in your mind? Anyone been sitting, meditating on Jesus coming in all his glory? Isn't it interesting that we usually think of Jesus walking alongside us, Jesus human? This is the picture for today. This is the picture the Father wants you to know, that you have an inheritance. And the reason that you have that is in these verses now. Let's have a listen. Jesus says, For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Can you hear Keith Green? Keith Green is someone that wrote this whole text in a song and so those of you that know Keith Green he kind of tells a story through music and so at this point he would say then the righteous ones will reply Lord when did we ever see you hungry and feed you and the thirst or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger showing and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothes when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you Lord and the king I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth when you did it to one of the least of these. My brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Who can grasp that? The 
king of glory is going to say, when you were doing that to the least, you were doing it to me. The least of these. This is a church where we really value remembering these words. Not only do we fill pantries at the mustard tree up shop or serve brekkie to the hundred kids every week at the Mount Evelyn Primary School, we know that these words are like my mum and dad. They're personal. They're individual. And we respond because whenever we feed or give drink or give hospitality to a stranger, whenever we clothe the poor, whenever we minister to the sick and the hurting, whenever we do this for the least and to the least, we're doing it to our Jesus. Isn't it rewarding enough just to see kindness and to be able to see the response to kindness? But this is another whole layer that we're being invited into, that this is creating a kingdom inheritance And did you notice that half the time we're not even aware of it? Just like these people here, when? When did we do this? They were astonished that the king was applauding them because that wasn't the reason that they did it. They found him and every person of the kingdom who remembers the poor, every righteous and just one as described here, will find Jesus as you serve as you move close to them. Now, there's a whole passage that uh, comes after that, and it's what happens when people refuse the invitation to feed the poor, to be caring for the stranger. And I was going to read that as well right now, but I think with what happened at communion, I think we've already declared we are already on that side where we are free from any refusal of the kingdom. We are free to receive all of the fullness of the kingdom. So you can read on. We don't have a slide for that. You can read on if you'd like to see what happens for those that refuse this invitation from the king. When we are in a place of invitation, it usually comes through Jesus in a number of ways. And in Matthew, he was really good at recording details. And before this story, before we hear about the King of Glory, he is recording Jesus' words. And there were things like, there was a wedding banquet and everyone was invited. Do you remember this story in Matthew? And some people refused to come. So they went out onto the streets and they invited everyone in and they were the ones that came, the ones that got invited, got shut out because they refused. Hear the word refused. And then there's another story that Matthew tells before this story about another wedding where the bridegroom was going to be coming and there were some virgins with lamps that had oil in it and these virgins wanted to make sure they had light for when the bridegroom came. And so they put oil in a lamp They were prepared. They were ready. And there were others who refused to be prepared and stay alert. And the bridegroom came and Jesus said that others were locked out from that celebration. And then there's another story as well, another parable about money, bags of gold. And the master was going on a long journey and gave out bags of gold to all these servants. And then... Later, he came back to see what they'd done with those bags. And some had multiplied. Some had put that money to work. Some had invested. And others refused and buried what they had. So leading up to this particular passage, where Jesus is talking about the least, he's telling us there are things that we can join in now before he comes back as the king of glory and he's noticing every kindness that you bring to others. Every time you are aware of the least, there he is. Every time you step towards those that are in need, you will find him. So really quickly, we're going to go three, through three very practical implications The first one is being with the least of these is practicing nearness to Jesus. In our daily life, 
Jesus is not hiding from us. In our daily life, he's in plain sight, sometimes disguised. And you will find him if you come near the least. A hungry person, a thirsty person, a person that needs clothes, a person that needs healing touch, a stranger, you'll find him with them. The least of these. And so there's a very clever scholar that says, we are, when we're present to the poor, Christ himself will be especially present. And if you're brave enough to do this, if you're brave enough to open your homes, even though it's a little bit scary and messy, even though it's uncomfortable at times, even though it might stretch us, you will find it's a privilege to be serving the least because you'll find Jesus there. So our first invitation today is, are you finding nearness the nearness of Jesus as you come alongside someone who's the least of these. You will find Jesus amongst them. It starts with you and it starts with me and it starts with our households and it starts with our daily life. So number two is we put this into practice in our daily life. I feel like I don't even need to say anything about this because you guys do this so well. You are an amazing group of people Individually, there's barely a week that would go by where one of you would sneak up. We don't shout it from the rooftops, this church. We don't put it all over socials, but you'd sneak up to me and say, Di, can I tell you what happened this week? I was serving blah, 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 and this happened, and I just felt the presence of Jesus in a way I've never felt before. It was as if he was there. That happens every week, probably every day, but I get to hear those stories that are in the cone of silence that I can then just say, thank you, Jesus, for such an amazing group of people that are following you as part of their individual daily practice. This practice can become an unconscious habit like the righteous ones where we don't even know (laughs) that that there's going to be something at the end of that. We're there just to serve. We're there just to be loving others and caring for others. And all those little actions every day are building deep and real friendship with people that have names, people that have needs, people that are not a project but are our friends. And so it's my dream to continue to say, keep going, YVV. Let's be that church where our way of life is so responsive to the needs around us and so responsive to the least of those. We have huge opportunities to come alongside people like that. There are so many strangers around us. (laughs) There's a joke. No, stop. Um, (laughs) So many strangers that you haven't met yet, right? (laughs) I won't go there. There are huge opportunities for people that are visiting our city as refugees. There are huge opportunities for students that are away from home, that are here for study. They miss their families, especially on days like this, but they're rarely out into homes with kids' tables and all that fun. Perhaps there's um, a warm home that you can offer. Perhaps there's a space in your schedule where you can find some strangers in the area and be hospitable to them and show some kindness. What about the sick? We believe that God heals the sick. But did you notice here that the king said, I was sick and you healed me? No. I was sick and you cared for me. We want to pray for healing for people, but we also want to care and walk alongside those as they receive their healing. As we heard last week, as David gave that wonderful story about his friend who he needed to walk alongside for years towards healing. We do that and we find Jesus among us. And prisoners, we have, is Ian here? I see Wendy's here today. Ian's off ministering somewhere, is he? Ian actually goes into prisons. He goes and help helps all the prisons in Victoria to get through prison fellowship. And there's others as well of you that are joining in that in different ways where prisoners are finding that people are visiting them and not forgetting about them. And there are many vineyard churches where we have ex-prisoners amongst us 
because they found the life of Jesus as someone's ministered to them. Jesus is in disguise. Do you see him when you're with the least? I've got lots of amazing friends and I feel very blessed. But my question for me, and it may be for you as well, is do, have, do I have many people in my life that are least of these? Do I make space for the least of these so that they are called brother and sister? Number three, <clears throat> being with the least of these is an opportunity to experience our own poverty. Hmm, interesting word to use. God chose each of us. You are all chosen, but we can't boast about who we are. We boast about him. We're so grateful that I know Jesus now, and through my need of him, my poverty, my emptiness, I boast of him who's made me whole. We will experience our own poverty as we step into these areas like I did as a 10-year-old, it was messy but not scary. It was uncomfortable and costly, but it was rewarding. We saw that there was a change happening for this family. And so I want to say to you today, if you're sitting here thinking, I'm the least, I'm sitting here today feeling pretty under-resourced, I'm sitting here today feeling pretty much like I'm poor in spirit. I want to say with a voice that is echoed by all my friends here, you are welcome in this church. If you feel like you are, this is the best place for you to find a seat at the table. This is a place where you are welcome and that you will be able to participate in the life that we have. You are welcome if you're feeling you are the least. And for those of us that are feeling like we kind of have resources and we have privilege and we have the ability to make choices, let's not be comfortable in welcoming those that are joining us. Let's continue to put that invitation out. And I want to finish with a story, a story that might make sense. It's about a well-meaning church in Canada. So it's, you can just go, oh, who's she talking about? <laughs> it was in Canada, all right? And in Canada, there was this big city, Toronto, and people lived in tree-lined streets in the suburbs. And this church decided they were going to go drive into the poorer, poorer area, and they were going to serve and build a soup kitchen once a week. They called it a weekly program. We don't call things like that a program. We say, let's go and see what's needed. <laughs> we respond to needs. Into the story. Sorry, I'm preaching. Anyway, they decided that they were going to build a soup, ki a soup kitchen once a week and they would drive in, it would serve the soup really good and then they would drive home to their big houses. Excuse me. <coughs> They did this for a number of months, and then, here's a the key, they decided to get some feedback from those people that were there. And the feedback that they got from the homeless, from the herders that were there, was they wanted to bring food to share as part of it. The feedback that they got was that they wanted to give their food vouchers share during this soup kitchen. They wanted to help out serving the suburbanites heard them and totally changed their approach. They turned this whole experience into kinship and friendship. They turned it all into a family table. They turned it all into fellowship, shared. Everyone came and participated and shared things together. And they asked the homeless and the hurting, come and sit at tables together. They didn't stay in the kitchen, they all sat together. Sound familiar? 
I know a lot of us are familiar with this and that these people, these hurting people then took the initiative and served them. Location that was the location and they were being served. Doesn't it take humility and such depth of relationships for that sort of thing to develop? This is going on in neighbourhoods all around us. And this is the heart that we have as the vineyard, that we would together share all that we have as Jesus is moving into our neighbourhood, that we together would find Jesus amongst us sitting at the table. So today, basically, we are talking about a word that is in our name. Yarra, Valley, this is location, vineyard, Christian. What's the last word? Fellowship. We're talking about fellowship. Often there are discussions about, oh, that's an old word. We should change that word. Why don't we just call ourselves a church or one of those trendy church names? And every time we bring that question to the table, the Holy Spirit says, I want you to be a fellowship. I want you to share in this community. It's going to be a marker for us. It might change in years to come, but right now the call for us is to continue to be a fellowship that's like my family story. It's messy. It's costly. There's sacrifice. We have to host. We have to also share what we have. But like in Acts 2, we see that there's a whole word that in Greek captures this koinonia, fellowship. It's shared participation for all its members All things are in common. Now I'm feeling challenged. There's tangible action oriented where space and time and stuff is shared in fellowship. And there's a real description all through the New Testament that Jesus is saying and his apostles are saying and describes and prescribes the lifestyle of a church, of a fellowship, of living in fellowship with Jesus is to alleviate poverty in communities. The New Testament says that it's to bring financial support to others. It's also to focus on the good news of the kingdom and bring good news. And there's a generosity of resources, just as, we, as we've been saying today. Thank you for all that you're sharing. This tiny church of four banks and three people, three and three over there, (laughs) this tiny church has a wide reach and it's called fellowship and everyone is welcome. And today, that's how we're finishing our Remember the Poor series, the gospel of the poor, is to remind us we've been called and named to be a fellowship And that is why we find Jesus, because the fellowship that is started and originated is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the enjoyment that they experience in fellowship with one another, and they've invited us in. And when Jesus returns, there will be an inheritance that you will receive. You can, st- you can stand on that promise and you can build your life on that promise. As we experience the joy of sharing our lives and our resources in real community, we do that and heaven is on earth now through every exchange. And we give our time to the family of God but also to the least and we get a glimpse of that picture that we saw, the king coming back to say, Come to me and receive your inheritance. And every time we emotionally spend ourselves for another, we can feel God's love and commitment to us. Our limited resources, generously shared, taps into his limitless resources that are available and experienced to all. So it's not comfortable. It's a little bit scary And it's also a risky thing for some of us, but it's worth it. And some of you right now are nodding. Some of you have just got gentle tears because this is your heartbeat and you live it. I just want to bless those people that are feeling an emotional response right now. That's part of the reward of Jesus saying, I see you. 
thank you. And I'm standing here just hearing his voice saying, thank you. Others of us have heard this passage and say, hmm, I don't think I know God's love enough. I don't think I know him well enough. And so I'm not feeling very comfortable right now. In fact, I want to secure you with this truth. If you're feeling like, what if I'm a goat? <laughs> what if I go on that side because I haven't done enough? It's not about calling you to do more. It's calling you to be in fellowship with Jesus and eat your life captured in his your life given to his. And he wants you to know that he loves you with an everlasting, everlasting love. You did not earn his love and you cannot lose his love. If you find that hard to believe and you think I'm talking to someone else in this room right now, someone that's more holy, someone that's better, someone that's nicer, someone that doesn't lose their... Oh, no. If you think I'm talking to someone else, someone that didn't screw up their marriage or didn't screw up a savings account or didn't screw up their career, I'm not talking to someone else. Normal, ordinary people is who we are. And God is saying today, I'm talking straight to you I love you, he says, and you don't earn my love. And you can't lose my love. You can refuse, as we heard in those stories. You can say no, but that love doesn't stop. You remain in his love. It's like this story. I don't know if you've heard this story of this little four-year-old that went to the ocean for the first time. The four-year-old standing there, waves are crashing in, and with their little language, they said, is it ever going to stop? Is anyone going to shut that off and turn it off? And their dad says, no, this is the ocean. That's what his love is like. It just keeps rolling in. You can separate yourself from that rolling love. You can refuse to go to the ocean of his love. But it doesn't get turned off. It's there forever. His love is with you forever. It's not when you've done enough. It's not when you've earned enough. It's not if you've gone too far and you feel like he's, he's switched off the love. He will never turn away. But you get to choose whether you're going to come to him. You will never live an unloved day in your life. Never. You never live an unloved day in your life. If someone's told you that, they've read the second part of this story and not focused on the first part, where everyone is invited, where everyone comes to the table. You will never live an unloved day, but you get to choose whether you want to be a part of that love by being with him and also saying yes to him. And so whether you've heard that for the first time today and you want to say, I want to be in there, I want to be part of that rolling love that will be with me forever and then I will be able to stand before the King of glory and I will also be part of him saying, come and receive my inheritance. If you've never heard that, today could be your day to say, I'm going to be a part of that for my life. I'm going to step into that and give all of my life. And for those of us that are comfortable and have heard that many, many times, the invitation is still there for us, that you will never live an unloved day in your life and that you can step more and more into that as you serve the least, as you have been doing so beautifully. <clears throat> if someone told you that God only loves good people, wrong. There are people all around the world right now totally oblivious to the fact that God loves them. But he loves them. If someone told you that God gets ticked off and cranky and he's a vindictive God, wrong. That's us. <laughs> That's who we are very often. We're often the ones that get ticked off and angry and want to repay people and get cranky. And so that's why we come into the ocean of his love, which is always there to wash us clean, just like what happened today with communion. We come and say, you've forgiven us. 
We've got to reset every time we do that. And so it's my privilege to say to you as we finish today that you can receive his love, you can respond to his love, and you can choose to be in his kingdom now. <laughs> and you can continue to be discovering what Psalm 103 says about God. God is sheer mercy and grace. He's not easily angered. He's rich in love. He doesn't endlessly nag and scold. He doesn't hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as heaven is over earth, so strong is his love for those who fear him. As far as sun rises from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. As parents feel for their children, God feels for each of those who fear him. Will you build your life on this promise? to serve those that are among us, to go out to those as Jesus did and find him there extending his love in a fresh way. I have a sense that for today, Father's Day, this was an unusual message, but I had a sense that today this was a reminder for all of us as we finished a series, but for today I felt like that there were some who really needed to hear some of this. That some really needed to hear that God's love is for now. And so I just want to simply finish today by offering any of you that would like to have a prayer, I'd like to pray on your behalf. And the benefit of this prayer is that you will receive a deeper expression and experience of God's love. So I'm going to ask if you would like to be bold, if you would like to be real, if you would like to experience more of God's love, would you stand now? Just invite you to stand. I'm going to pray a prayer where you are. Hmm. So the Son of God will return with all his glory and all his angels. Just picture yourself right now as I pray. Jesus, look on these, your brothers and sisters, those that are standing right now asking for the Father's blessing to come. Would you look now, look upon these that are standing with kindness and with grace, would you grant each of us the Father's blessing right now? If it's for the first time, Lord, we ask that there would be an extravagant sense of the Father's love flowing into their hearts and through their minds and through the body that the love of God would remove any excuse where someone's told them that they're the exception of the rule or that they have things going on in their minds that says, I'm not worthy of his love right now, Lord. Would you speak louder? Please, Jesus, would you speak louder? Would you remove any echoing voices in our minds from the past that says we blew it and we can never recover that ground again? Would you remove any echoing voices that says that I won't be acceptable to you, Jesus? And would you come now like an ocean and roll your love over our lives in a very real, truthful way because you are the truth. And we receive all that you have through your words, through your truth, and through the experience of your spirit coming and revealing the Father's love to us right now. And the invitation is come. Everyone that's here that can hear my voice, come and enter into his love. This everlasting love that will not leave you a day in your life. It's yours and it's free. So let healing come, Lord. Let there be healing today. 
Let our hearts be healed again by the power and the presence of your love. Thank you that we can build our life on your promise, your promise that you love us, and that as we go from this room today, we will serve those through your love and find you with us. And so receive, and this is the last phrase I want you to hear today before we finish. God says, I'm very fond of you. God says to you today, I'm very fond of you. Can you feel that affirmation? On this Father's Day, we receive that, God. Thank you for the work that you're doing through your spirit.